Hi sweeties, how are you doing? Welcome to Nana Sim. If this is your first time of coming across this channel, sweetheart, kindly smash that subscribe button and turn on the notification so you are notified each time I upload and please give this video a thumb up. I appreciate you all so much and I am saying massive shout out to every one of you for all the love and support you all give me here. I am truly grateful. Thank you all so much. So today we'll be talking something very important. You know we have talked about, I think uh, we have done one, two, three, four, five and all that. I mean, if you are a Karen, you cannot see this and you cannot be a Karen and uh, you are like using most of the things that were invented by black people. So it's either you choose one, it's either you let go of your Karen or you embrace the fact that black people did so many great things because you can't be using what they invented. And you are still being ready to the season. And the truth is that they are even not finding this funny because they feel like the man is divided. Because they, they were, I saw in the comment section, they were all pissed. They were like, why are you always like trying to like, you know, bring more division and all that? Yeah, you all already know that there is, because they say more division. You all already know that there is division. But then there is nothing wrong with what he's saying because you cannot be ready to the season and like everything around you is all being invented by black people and all that no you have to choose one let go of your current and embrace what you are supposed to embrace and he was also complaining why most of these things are not being taught in school and all that because the history they do not want you to know all this because these are the things that should be taught in school but they want you to ban everything black because everything black is violent and who uh, woke, uh, 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 Florida is where woke goes to die and the rest of it. You know what? Stay with, you are absolutely going to enjoy this. Stay close to the screen. Or I'm going to roll this clip. We'll come back to talk about it. And I absolutely will read all your comments. Let me know what you all think in the comment section. And should I am rolling the clip. If you're still committed to being a racist in America, here are some things you can't unsee. Part six, the Pepsi challenge. Dude, what are you doing? Oh, I'm reading a book called The Luckiest Man in the World by Papa Jake. He's a TikTok creator that I love. Wow, what's up with you? Hey, homeboy, did you know you would not be drinking that Pepsi if it weren't for Black America? <laughs> what? I know, it's crazy, right? Don't leave me hanging, bro. Spill the beans. Listen, Pepsi started 130 years ago. They're just a year older than or younger than Coca-Cola. And they had always been in Coca-Cola's shadow. You know, they've been a struggling soda manufacturer. World War I hit them really hard because they had bought so much sugar commodities. And after the war, the prices fell and that just almost tanked Pepsi. Now, during the Great Depression, they tried to sell themselves not once, not twice, but three times to Coca-Cola. Coke's asshole CEO said he would rather buy their assets at auction than ever spend a dime on their competitor, which is crazy. It sounds like somebody threw a turd in Pepsi's punch bowl. Coming out of the Great Depression, Pepsi had a really ingenious idea. They started to buy 12-ounce recycled beer bottles and sell them for a nickel, the same price Coke was selling a 6-ounce bottle for. And when times were so hard, man, being able to get twice the amount of soda for the same price was a huge deal. And then World War II hit. Wait a second. Are you trying to tell me black Americans recycled beer bottles for Pepsi? That's how they helped them? Now, in the early 1940s, Pepsi got a new president. His name was Walter Mack. He was very progressive. He saw how Pepsi and Coke and other competitors were using, like, blackface and stereotypes in their advertising in a negative portrayal or they just weren't advertising to black Americans at all. He saw that this was a market they could go after because there was about 14 million black Americans at the time. Now his stroke of genius is in hiring a band named Edward Boyd who is a marketing guru. Did you know Justin Danger Nunley that Edward Boyd escorted Hattie McDaniel to the 1939 Oscars for her nomination for Gone with the Wind and Miss McDaniel won for Best Supporting Actress become the first black American to ever win Academy Award. Wait a second. You're telling me a white 
major owned corporation in America entrusted its marketing plan to 12 black American marketing executives? What the? Now, Edward Boyd hired 12 black Americans, marketing whizzes, to create this team where they would go out into America and start to market this to black Americans and other people who weren't associated with Pepsi. Now, keep in mind there were 14 million black Americans at the time. That's a huge number, about 10% of America. So this was a chance to go after Coke. They went all over the country, and in the Deep South, they ran into a lot of problems. A lot of people didn't want them marketing to white people or to black people down there. Even some people that worked at Pepsi weren't real keen on it. They were even harassed by the KKK. But eventually, as they kept going around the South, they got they were started to be treated as celebrities in some of the towns they arrived at, believe it or not. Dude, that sucks. Yeah, but they were so effective. They weren't selling sugar water to people. They were selling a brand and a lifestyle that Pepsi wanted pushed out there. Now, Pepsi back then had even created a series of black Americans who were prominent, like Rosa Parks, etc., and they highlighted this in their marketing. And they went after the black community, not in the negative stereotype way like the Uncle Remus and the other really bad degrading ads like you see above. They wanted to present it in a more confident family way. Does that make sense? And they were genius in doing so because for the first time ever, Pepsi took shares of Coke. And in Chicago, they were so effective, they, for the first time ever, outsold Coke in one of the biggest markets. That's what Mr. Boyd and his team did at Pepsi? Wow. Listen, Mr. Boyd, his marketing team, or Mr. Mack, are the heroes in this chapter of Pepsi's history. I mean, did you know Pepsi's almost as twice as big as Coca-Cola? I mean, wow. This should be a movie. Does Tyler Perry know? I don't know. He hadn't called me back. I don't have voicemail. True, true. You know, sadly, after Mr. Mack retired, Mr. Boyd was let go and Pepsi dropped the campaign to go to market to black Americans as much as they were. And Mr. Boyd went on to have executive positions at several other companies. But Mr. Boyd is somebody I'd never heard of, and I'm not sure how many people had. He is the man who is considered the one for creating niche consumerism, a niche market. It's a black man who did this. He was doing things nobody else was doing at the time. He's experienced all kinds of racism and bias. And somehow, this man rose through it all, helped turn Pepsi's fortunes around several other companies, and he lived a long life. He died at the age of 92. They sure didn't teach that kind of stuff at my high school. We went to the same high school, dumbass. Oh, yeah, we did. Oops. Dude, you dropped some bombs on me today. It's what I do. Stay tuned for part seven, Jack Daniels, and have an amazing day. Listen, if you're still committed to being a racist in this country, then this is just going to blow your mind. Part seven, the white Muhammad Ali. Warning. This is a Jiffy Pop kind of story. Now, I've been asked several times, why don't I ever do videos on white people? <sighs> if I have to explain it, but... So today I'm going to, and um, I don't think it's the kind of white person you are probably thinking about. Now, we all know Muhammad Ali is one of the greatest boxers and sports entertainers of all time. He was a civil rights leader, he was outspoken, and he was tough as nails. Now, his birth name that he was given was Cassius Clay Jr. His father was Cassius Clay. His father was Herman Clay, who was enslaved by the uh, Clay family in Kentucky. In the Clay family was a man named Cassius Clay. He did not have anything to do with Muhammad's grandfather, but Muhammad's grandfather was very impressed with this Cassius Clay. Now, Cassius was born in 1810 in Kentucky, and he had six brothers and sisters. And he went to Transylvania University. No, not with Dracula. It's a college in Kentucky. And then he went to Yale for law school. And this is where his life took a very different turn. Now, Cassius Clay saw a life-changing, 
lecture by William Lloyd Garrison while at Yale University. Mr. Garrison was one of the leading abolitionists in the country. Now, Mr. Clay's family was one of the wealthiest plantation and slave owners in the country, and he's changing his mind about slavery. It's really hard to tell this story because it's so incredible. There's so many parts. So I'm just going to kind of tell it anecdotally. I'm just going to give you snippets of his life as he went, some of the more amazing things this man has done. I'm not sure he was Catholic, but he did have 10 kids. So why do I call this man the white Muhammad Ali? Well, he was highly intelligent. He was brash. He was outspoken. He was tough as nails. And he never backed down from a fight. And he actually knew Muhammad Ali's kinfolk. After coming back from Yale University, he went out against his family and said, I'm against slavery. So much so, he started a newspaper, an anti-slavery newspaper in Kentucky. Now, when his father passed away, he inherited uh, his enslaved uh, Americans that he had, and Cassius Clay immediately released them, costing his family over a million dollars in doing so, and gave most of them landing cash upon their release. This is not what makes this man so interesting. And the fact we were never taught about him in school speaks volumes. He was a very outspoken man on abolition, right? Now, in people who were for emancipation wanted to use the system and vote slavery out. Abolitionists wanted it ended immediately. And that's what Cassius Clay was all about. This is what a gangster looked like in the 1850s. Cassius Clay was at a political debate. While he was there, a pro-slavery group had hired a man named Sam Brown to unalive Cassius Clay. Well, when he started coming to the crowd to him, Cassius had pulled out a big Bowie knife with a silver handle that he carried. Sam Brown shot, hit the knife, pissing Mr. Clay off when he went to work on Mr. Brown, tagging him in the chest, cutting off his ear, his nose, gouging out an eye, and then picking up him up and throwing him up over a six-foot wall where he then cashed in his 401k. Now, he started the True American, the anti-slavery newspaper in 1845, and he knew he was going to be in trouble doing this in Kentucky, and he was right. He got tons of death threats, some written in blood, so much so he had two four-inch cannon loaded with musket balls and screws and nails at the end of the hallway in his office to protect him and his staff. No matter the attempts, the pro-slavery people couldn't seem to stop Cassius Clay. It's only when he was bedridden with typhoid fever did about 50 pro-slavery guys come in and burn his office to the ground and destroy his printing press. What did Mr. Clay do? He just went to Cincinnati and opened a new newspaper. Listen, Cassius Clay was at a political rally and a man named Cyrus Squire, who was a pro-slavery politician, was there. And Cassius Clay spoke out very strongly against slavery, angering Mr. Squire's six sons, who attacked Cassius Clay, stabbing him. Well, with his trusted Bowie knife, he tagged a few of them, got to Cyrus Squires, and cashed in his 401k. Did you know he donated 10 acres of his land to a gentleman in Kentucky who started Berea College, which was the first integrated and co-ed college in the South? It's still open today and has not charged tuition since 1892. Go Mountaineers! How tough was Cassius Clay? Well, he is known as probably the greatest American duelist in history. You know, the kind of 10 paces turn around and bang. Yeah, this man didn't lose. There was a man who had a beef with Cassius Clay and called him out to a duel on the day of his wedding, knowing Cassius Clay wouldn't show up. This angered Clay. So what did he do? He rescheduled the duel and showed up. This man was so afraid of having to duel him the next day, he unalived himself the night before. Now let's talk about how the cow meets the cabbage or the rubber meets the road is a better way to say it maybe, is that Cassius Clay's cousin was Henry Clay, one of the most powerful senators in U.S. history. I don't think he ever lost a court case that he defended, which is nuts when you think about it. So he became friends with Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln was considering putting Cassius Clay on his vice president ticket, except Clay was pretty controversial and hard-edged and didn't back down from anybody. Now, this is what they don't talk about, and this is really, really important. Cassius Clay was appointed the ambassador to Russia by Abraham Lincoln, and then the Civil War kicked off. Cassius Clay did two things to forever change American history for the better and to bring about an end to slavery. First, 
He told Russia they better not recognize the Confederacy in any way, shape, or form. And then he convinced Russia to tell Britain and France, if you support the Confederacy, Russia will go to war with you. Do you know how badass that is? And second, he told Lincoln he would get those countries to turn on the U.S. if he didn't sign the Emancipation Proclamation. Emancipation Proclamation, which Lincoln did later that year, two years earlier than he wanted to. Oh yeah, while he was ambassador to Russia, he helped negotiate the Alaska Purchase that we got from Russia. Sometimes standing up for the right thing can cost you everything. And Cassius Clay was willing to put his name and his fortune on the line over and over and over again to speak out against slavery. He wasn't about talking. He was about doing. At a speech he gave, he brought out a Bible and said, your morality, if you believe in the Bible, should tell you slavery is wrong. He brought up the U.S. Constitution. He said, if you believe in Constitution and law of man, this should prove to you slavery is wrong. And then he pulled out his two pistols and set them down on the table. And it said, if the law of God and the law of men don't convince you, maybe this will. That's how gangster Cassius Clay was. I always try to save the best for last. Cassius Clay had been divorced and his wife still lived at their big estate, Whitehall, in Kentucky. He had got wind that her current husband or boyfriend and a friend were about to rob his estate. There was a lot of valuables there. So he went to the estate waiting. When they came in, he cashed in both of their 401ks, once by tagging a guy in the chest with his bowie knife and the other with a silver bullet. Here's the crazy part. He was 89 years old. He died just a few years later, peacefully in his sleep. Now, I don't know how many men's 401ks he's cashed in, but it was quite a few. And if you were for slavery and you crossed this path, there's a good chance your 401k is going to have zero in it too. This is American history. This is the history we should talk about. But this is the history schools don't teach us. I'm sure the Daughters of Liberty would never want this in there. But I find this story fascinating and amazing. And I've only known about it for a few years. And it's taken me this long to want to tell it because there's so much to it. And it's just not widely talked about. So I hope you enjoyed this about Cassius Clay, one of the most badass politicians and abolitionists in U.S. history. I hope you have a great day. <clears throat> so this is what we got from the video. And um, trust me, I am going to say that uh, this is absolutely amazing. He did a great job. He absolutely nailed it. And yeah, let me tell you something. Of course, you all know how the uh, history, the teaching school is all whitewashed and the rest of it. I mean, and they still go ahead to tell you that uh, uh, black American history is violent and uh, it's not something that should be taught. And when they were the one that caused all the violence, I mean, from beginning to end, and still are the ones running away from teaching it and CRT and the rest of it, because they have always been saying, ban everything black, ban everything like in everything like books, do not teach it. We don't want to hear anything that I've got to do. Just, and then I keep asking or keep telling myself, how do you want to bet, like, you know, how do you want to erase somebody's history? I mean, your history is like your foundation. How do you want to like uproot somebody's foundation? It's almost impossible. And uh, they have always known from the onset, like, you know, that slavery is not a great thing to do and all that, but, you know, they will still like look for a way and uh, to justify one or two things, especially when they try to use Bible to like, you know, justify some certain things. I remember there was a video that I made about a black Christian, black pastor who was sacked because he told them the truth about slavery because they used Bible. And then he also put other places in the Bible where it says, that slavery is not because the okay the uh, the people that we're talking about it were like yeah that the Bible said that uh, 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 that the, like the uh, the master and the slave are more like siblings. It is not the um, there is nothing like being more like slave, uh, siblings. A slave is a slave. A master is a master, and this is something they have to like you know. So sometimes they always, you know, one thing with people, they always look for a way to get the one that will sweep what they are talking about at that point in time and then leaving other 
parts aside and all that i don't like going through the going to the bible so what i am trying to say in essence is that i absolutely enjoyed this he did a great job with the analysis and all of that and after watching the, i think i have done one two three four and the rest of it and um, if you think after watching this and you want to continue to be a red to the city to black people you have a very big problem black people are not your problem you have there is something is something wrong with you so this is where i am going to draw the cut in thank you all so much for all the love and support i appreciate you all let me know what you all think uh, in the comment section i see you all in my next video bye for and if there is something you also want to like you know some of the, of the things that were invented by black people you also want to include why not feel free to let us know also in the comment section absolutely i will be reading your comments bye for now